Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Mike Anderson. My guest this week is Assistant Wildlife Division Chief Casey Anderson. Today we're going to talk winter wildlife. Casey, the last couple weeks have been a roller coaster for our wildlife here in North Dakota. How are the wildlife populations holding up? Well, luckily, winter didn't come till probably mid-January where it started to get uh, kind of tough for things out there as far as North Dakota winters go. Um, overall, I think uh, wildlife has been handling winter pretty good. Um, but right now, as the temperatures have dropped and some snow has come on, um, that's when the that's when it's going to get a little tougher. But the fact that we didn't have a very hard winter through December and mid-January is going to help a lot of those critters out across the landscape. Okay, uh, last week we had negative 35 and I think it was wind chill negative 75 in Grand Forks. What do these critters do to survive? Right, yeah, well that, that's definitely uh, um, something a lot of us, if we walked outside at all, thought about, you know, how does anything live out here? Um, in this type of weather, but you know, if if they have the thermal habitat, the thermal cover, one or two days isn't too bad. You know, they they'll hold up, you know, use their fat reserves, try to stay out of the wind and things like that. It's uh, it's long stretches that get really tough, but uh, um, there was probably some some animals out there that definitely. You know, for one reason or the other, whether they were already stressed for another reason, you know, that, that's kind of the tipping point when it gets that cold, you know, if, if they have other stressors on them already. Sure, and we had rain <coughs> mixed into that. Yeah, in some areas of the state we had a little bit of rain, and of course that, if you had any snow cover that, that, that the rain fell on, you're going to get kind of that crust that uh, makes moving around tough, and it makes uh, um, digging down for food if you're an animal that needs to dig down to get to some food source, that's that makes it awful tough when it get that crust on there. But, but luckily we didn't have a whole lot of snow across the state when we got that. So, um, explain to our viewers what is thermal cover. Well, thermal cover, you know, there's a lot of different types of thermal cover out there, but um, essentially it's anything that's going to block the wind and help that animal hold its own body heat. Um, and so things like, you know, as long as cattails aren't filled with uh, Snow, the, they're really good thermal cover in a lot of instances. Um, also, you can get some conifer type of trees um, that are good thermal cover, or anything that's you know kind of going to block the wind. Tall, tall type of grass until there's always that point in North Dakota where if we get enough snow, some of that thermal cover gets tough to find. But um, a lot of like say pheasants rely on cattails heavily for thermal cover for most of the winter. Sure. Uh, how does the snow impact? everything. Um, snow of course just makes it harder to travel around in a lot of cases um, and like we said if it starts to crust over then you get some trouble with uh, some animals being having a harder time getting down to food sources or getting across the snow to food sources. Um, so anything that is going to restrict their movements going to restrict them from getting between thermal cover and food source um, and that kind of thing. Just an extra stress yep. for the animal. Okay, uh, let's move into the wildlife species. How are the deer populations doing? Well, I think right now the deer are doing pretty, pretty good so far. Um, as we come into this, this colder stretch with a little more snow, now it's all going to depend on, you know, is there enough habitat out there, enough thermal cover, enough um, food sources that deer need um, to pull them through. Their fat reserves probably haven't been too taxed until right now. Um, just because of the easier December, and so um, it's the kind of a the snow cover is kind of a a blessing and a curse in a way for the deer. We get to have the ability to maybe have a better deer count um, when we get snow cover. We can do our surveys on white-tailed deer, but then we always realize that because of the snow, they're going to have a little harder time. So right, right. Do the temperature fluctuations do they uh, affect our deer populations? Say when you go from 35 <coughs> below to 35 above right. in a day's time. Yeah, it, it, uh, people think of it as, uh, boy, it really felt nice to get 35 degrees, but sometimes animals, when those real large fluctuations happen, they change their eating habits, they change things um, to the point where because of that warmer temperature, they don't need to eat as much, and then when you get a real cold snap again, kind of like we just set up for, 
um, animals have a hard time then ramping back up to get to the point where they've got enough, especially um, your ruminant type animals. They've got enough uh, food feed in their rumen to generate heat. And so those real big swings sometimes are, are hard on, on animals and they tend to move different places because of those and uh, sometimes don't get back to the right food sources they need. But it always feels nice when it warms up like that in the winter, but actually, you know, some type of mediocre steadiness is probably better. Sure. Uh, let's move into pheasants and grouse. Uh, how are the pheasants and grouse doing? So far we haven't heard um, a lot about people finding um, pheasants and things that were, you know, having trouble or actually dead because of the winter. Um, which was a little surprising sometimes when we get those rains like we had. That's a, that's a gimme that pheasants aren't going to make it very well through that stuff. They're not a, not a native bird. Um, and you can usually tell if you see grouse and pheasants together on a cold day. It usually looks like the grouse are maybe making fun of the pheasant <laughs> in some instances because our sharp-tailed grouse are, are very um, adapted to our winters up here. And I mean, they'll bury in the snow. They'll, they'll do a lot of things to to stay warm where pheasants will just kind of hang out and hope it gets warmer. Sure, I think. sure. Uh, how about some other wildlife species? Pronghorns, turkeys, moose, elk. How do they survive during this? Right, our, our, our larger ungulates, the uh, moose and elk, they handle winter a little bit better. Um, they're just because of their longer legs and things like that, they have the ability to move around a little bit better. Um, but it, it always stresses, you know, every animal out there to some extent. Um, and so moose and elk typically do pretty good. Um, pronghorn and things, you know, the southwest, North Dakota hasn't had a lot of snow yet. Um, and so, and they've had some warmer temperatures, so I, I would anticipate that our pronghorn are, are still doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, if they can find, uh, navigate through, they'll, they'll also move quite a bit farther than some other species um, if they have to. And so as long as snow doesn't sneak up on them, they can sometimes move out of it um, to some extent, but so far that southwest has, has looked pretty decent as far as their winter goes. Sure. Um, days are getting longer in February here. Does that help our wildlife species? Yeah, as the days get longer, of course, you get more th thermal hours, more sun. To, you know, if, if the sun is shining and they can lay in a spot where there's no wind and soak up the sun, that, that really helps keep maintain body temperature sure. and, and keep reserves that they might have left. Okay. You know, every year it seems like we get a March or April spring blizzard. What's that do for our wildlife? Right. In, in a lot of cases, those late spring blizzards are the ones that we see, I don't, for lack of a better term, finish some of those animals off that are stressed to the point where their reserves are gone. Um, you know, they've, they've struggled. Even though it seems like there should be enough food out there, that last big exposure to a weather event like that can sometimes catch up to them just because they don't they're in such poor condition coming out of winter already um and so hopefully if things go right we won't have too many of those but right right but uh, as we know north dakota's good at throwing a curveball at us casey what can we as humans do during the winter or before winter to help these wildlife critters right we have uh, uh, you know a lot of our land in north dakota is privately owned um and so as as People out on the landscape or, or landowners that are out on the landscape, they're seeing these critters throughout the winter. You know, they're starting to notice, okay, at this point in time, they start, these animals started to act different. There's something, something that stressed them to change what they're doing. And so, you know, if, if landowners are, are concerned about that and they want to try to improve, you know, maybe thermal habitat is what's limiting them out there. Um, or things like that, you know, there's, there's opportunities to do that. Think about those things now as you're seeing those different types of changes on the landscape. And then you can start to maybe plan what you might want to do for future um, things on, on your land um, if you have that ability to, to put some habitat changes on the ground. Um, also, when we see wildlife in the wintertime and they're stressed, you know, deer group up, um, they group up because that's a spot where there might be good habitat, might be good food sources. Um, people should always just, you know, watch them from a distance. Every time you go in there to where those animals might be and you, you scare them off, they're, they're exerting energy to do that. And normally they wouldn't 
wouldn't have to do that if you just viewed them from a distance. And so whether it's, you know, a bunch of pheasants in an area and you know they're there, you know, you, while you're doing your winter activities, you might want to, you know, avoid from scaring them out in the open um, because every, every time they have to go out and expose themselves to get away from you is reducing their, their ability to make it through the winter. Right. They're stressed enough the way it right. is. Uh, let's move into something called the Winter Severity Index, Casey. What is that? Well, the Winter Severity Index is, it, is just a uh, index a lot of times put out by weather services and things that show, you know, how severe the winter has been, especially according to, uh, like, average winter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and obviously as the winter gets worse, that's going to look worse. And so it'll show you a history over time um, throughout the year of what happened. So sometimes when we are looking at, you know, how, how do we think animals did or how, like, say we have uh, our deer numbers, we count deer in the wintertime. Um, winter severity has a very big impact on probably fawning rates and things like that because as, as uh, does come out of winter and they are in less body condition, they're less likely to have a fawn, whether they reabsorb that to save themselves um, or they just can't complete the trimesters to finish out a fawn. And so <coughs> when we set numbers, say, we might say that we're going to give out between this and this many deer numbers um, according to our surveys for licenses. Our, and uh, then we look at the winter severity index. It might shift if we're a little more conservative or a little less conservative just because it's going to kind of give us an indication of maybe how many fawns are expected to be on the landscape, you know, how well production might might go through. Um, and then, of course, with any other wildlife, it's going to just kind of give you a, a little bit of, we do surveys and things, you know, and then we come out with the projected, you know, our pheasant's going to be up or down, what's the fall outlook look like and that kind of thing. And we c it, it can kind of help us gauge how that might turn out just because of, you know, how many might be left on the landscape, things like that. A lot of good information, Casey. Thank you. Individuals interested in taking a hunter education class in 2019 are reminded to register early as most classes are held in the first couple months of the calendar year. Interested students must click on the education link at the North Dakota Game and Fish Department's website at gf.nd.gov. Classes are listed by city and can also be sorted by date. Classes will be added throughout the year as they become finalized. To register for a class, click on enroll next to the specific class and follow the simple instructions. For Assistant Wildlife Division Chief Casey Anderson and the rest of the staff here at the Game and Fish Department, thanks for joining us for this week's Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.